Welcome to the afternoon session. Our first speaker will be Christopher Musco. Thanks, Haim. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about a problem that isn't something we traditionally study in randomized linear algebra, but that we've been able to solve using, oh, maybe I lost, this is the wrong clicker. That we've been able to solve using tools from randomized linear algebra. In particular, I'm going to be talking about a very classic problem in signal processing, maybe the most classic problem in signal processing, and how we can use randomized algorithmic tools to better understand this problem and get better theoretical balance and better practical algorithms than previously existed. So this is the problem. We're going to be talking about just fitting continuous functions based on a discrete number of samples from the continuous function. So I have some function y defines between, you can think of it as over, over time. I'll, I'll say time a lot, but it doesn't need to be time. It could be time, it could be space, it could be anything. It's defined between 0 to big T. And we want to take a number of discrete samples of that function and using those samples interpolate uh, the continuous function. Okay? Those samples might be noisy. So it might be that we can't access y, but instead y where we have some perturbation of our samples. Okay, so and of course our goal is to recover some function y tilde. It's a little hard to see the gray function underneath, but some function at y tilde that's close to the true function y over the entire interval 0 to t. So I want it over that whole fixed interval. OK, and we want to know how many samples do you require to reconstruct this function to do interpolation. And once we get those samples, how do we reconstruct the function in an efficient way? OK, so naively, this is an ill-posed problem. If I don't make any assumption about my signal, there's no reason to believe that discrete samples of a continuous signal will give any information about the whole signal, right? I could have some crazy signal jumping all around, so it's an ill-posed problem, unless I make some sort of assumption about the signal, like a smoothness assumption. And by far, one of the most common ways to add structure to your signal in signal processing is to make an assumption about its Fourier transform. So we don't impose structure on the signal itself, but we look at the continuous Fourier transform, which I have up there, y hat of, of xe, which is my notation for, for frequencies. And we say, we believe this Fourier transform is structured in some way. The most common way, the most common type of structure we see is we say the Fourier transform of the signal is band limited. So in particular, the signal is composed only of frequencies within a certain band limit f. So it doesn't contain any higher frequencies than f. And then you can ask how you can solve this interpolation problem when your signal is band limited. And this, of course, is a very well-studied problem, going back to the work of Shannon, Whitaker, Nyquist, and others. It's really at the foundation of signal processing and information theory. And how do you sample your signal? How do you sample band-limited signals and reconstruct them? Uh, so everyone has to think back to like their undergrad uh, signal processing course. And I hope everyone remembers this. If I have a function with band limit t, I can sample it uniformly at the Nyquist frequency. I'm sorry, band limit f. So you sample it uniformly at the Nyquist frequency, which means I need to take 1 over 2f samples per second. OK? That's what I need to reconstruct the function. And actually, there's a very simple algorithm for reconstructing the function once you take those uniform samples, which is sync interpolation, or sometimes called Shannon Whitaker interpolation. What you do is at any point t, that's not one of our samples, we're just going to set its value, y tilde of t, equal to the sum of, I'm going to place a sync function with width f at each of my other, the samples I took. And I'm going to look at like a point t and sum up the value at, of all of those sync functions. So that's how you can recover a signal from its Nyquist rate samples. Okay. So that's a, like great theory. Unfortunately, sync interpolation doesn't work over finite intervals from 0 to t, in theory or in practice. So in particular, it's that theory that you can recover the function really depends on the fact that we're talking about samples at spacing 1 over 2f going all the way out to infinity. 
And it really is important that if I want to reconstruct the signal at a point y of t, I need to take the sinks going out from 0 to infinity. Because if I instead have a function over a bounded interval and I truncate this sum of sinks, I get a lot of error. Because the sink function doesn't fall off quickly. It falls off like 1 over x. So if I try to analyze Shannon Whitaker interpolation for that first problem I stated, you get something that has polynomial dependence on some accuracy parameter epsilon, which is something we would like to avoid. OK? So this is sort of a well-known problem that uh, these classical sampling results don't extend to when you actually care about doing things in practice over finite intervals. But fortunately, there's a really beautiful line of work that deals with exactly this problem. And in particular, if I want to reconstruct band limit signals, um, OK, there's this line of work by Slepi and Landau and Pollock on what are known as prolate spheroidal wave functions. This work from the 60s, combined with more recent work by Vladimir Rockland and his co-authors, says that I can remove that polynomial on the epsilon dependence. I'm going to say I get some signal y that's equal. It's, Fourier trans it's the Fourier transform of some uh, function x plus noise. And they say that I can reconstruct y up to a error that depends on the two norm of my Fourier signal plus some factor depending on my noise using just ft plus log 1 over epsilon samples. OK? What is t, the total variance? Oh, t is my time bound. So I'm going from 0 to t. So classical sampling theory, you're taking 1 over f samples per second. So if Shannon Whitaker interpolation worked over fixed interval, you'd get ft samples. But to make it actually go through, you need ft over epsilon. And we're, this, this work gets ft plus log 1 over epsilon. OK? So we have an epsilon parameter depending on the, the energy of x, the two norm of x, because the, if you have a band limit signal, it can also jump around crazy if you're willing to pour enough energy into your, your Fourier transform. So that's why that term appears. And then this term, c, think of as a constant, because I'm not going to be able to recover my signal to anything better than additive error depending on the size of my noise. So ideally, c would be 1, but if, if we can get it up to 2, we'd also be happy with that. OK, yeah. Covering x only on this interval? Yes, we don't oh, know. It should not be time limited the actual signal x, right? So x is in Fourier domain, so we're only going to recover, we'll recover an x that is band, truly band limited, and then we're, we're evaluating this error. When I say sub t there, that means we're evaluating the error only between 0 and t. Yeah, so you only match the interval. Yeah. So we measure the error, the error, the error as between y tilde and this noisy thing called y. Uh, y is the true signal, so, oh, um, oh yeah, maybe, uh, sorry, this is, this is uh, not how I should have said it. It should be that y is equal to f star of x, and then we observe f star of x plus n. Yeah. yeah. Usually we're actually going to th think about the noiseless case, so I think on future slides that won't matter, but yeah, good pickup. Okay, so uh, that's the theorem. <laughs> The way it's proven is basically Slepian, and Landau, and Pollock showed there were these really nice smooth functions called prolate spheroidal wave functions that can serve as a smooth basis for all band limited functions on 0 to t. And then just like polynomials or other smooth functions, you can construct um, a quadrature scheme for actually like projecting a signal onto that basis. So that's sort of very roughly how you get a result like this. OK? Yeah. There are issues like this for functions on a circle. Um, so if you assume that it just repeats, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so if, if it's functions on a circle you, and you assume your function's periodic, then you can reduce everything to discrete for your case. So then these sort of issues don't show up. You can take, yeah. So this is truly for continuous functions where I'm making no, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I can't move to discrete for your line. OK, so. A very important conclusion from this line of work, and which comes out of the fact that you're using quadrature rules to project onto these prolate spherical wave functions, is that you actually shouldn't be using uniform sampling. So the quadrature rules that you can prove work do non-uniform sampling on the interval, where they concentrate time samples near the ends of your interval. And this saves you essentially, in theory, a quadratic, potentially quadratic loss that you would get from uniform sampling. Or you could have suffered a 1 over polynomial and epsilon loss. 
And this shouldn't be surprising. I mean, if you've seen interpolation of polynomials, in general, if we want good approximation of functions, we need to concentrate more samples towards the ends of our interval. OK, so what about Fourier structure beyond band-limited functions? In today's world, we often care about signals that aren't necessarily band-limited. I'm sure everyone's heard of compressed sensing, sparse recovery. Often our assumption is something very different. For example, that our signal is composed of a small number of frequencies that might be over a very wide band. Alternatively, it's very common to assume that your signal is a multiband signal, so it's composed of frequencies in some union of bands. And then even more generally, when you take a Bayesian perspective of this problem, you say, I'm not just going to restrict my signal to have frequencies within some limited subset, but you place different weights on frequencies. And you say, I'm putting a prior on what I believe my signal is. And I think higher frequencies are going to be less likely than smaller frequencies. And I want to solve like a statistical estimation problem under that prior. So Gaussian priors are very common. Cauchy-Lorentz priors are very common. Um, if you've heard of Kriging, kernel ridge regression, Gaussian process regression, all of these are equivalent to solving a Bayesian regression problem where you place some smooth prior on the frequencies in your Fourier transform. Okay? They have countless applications in the sciences and geosciences, really anywhere where you're analyzing time or space and trying to fit a smooth function. So what do we know about these much more general classes of signals? Really not much. If we're looking at the finite interval 0 to t, 50 years after this really nice work on prolate spheroidal wave functions, we don't know anything in terms of tight theoretical bounds for recovering signals. How many samples do we need? How do we do it efficiently? This changed slightly a couple years ago. So there's this really nice uh, sequence of papers uh, by Chen, Kane, Price, and Song. I think uh, Eric Price is around here. I'm not sure if he's here, but he's somewhere around. OK, yeah. Where basically they solved this continuous function fitting problem <coughs> for sparse signals. OK? So our work really builds on uh, this work except we're trying to solve it for a much, much broader class of constraints on your Fourier transform. So actually, before I state our results, are there any questions about the basic problem setup? Yeah. Uh, the result where you said non-uniform sampling is optimal, mm -hmm. is that a new result, or is that known? For, that's known for sparse Fourier functions now and for band-limited Fourier functions. Um, it's sort of known practically for many more classes of functions, but we don't have the theorems to back it up. OK, so what our result is, is three ingredients. The first, which I'm going to talk the least about today, is we give a very general way of characterizing the, the sample complexity for function fitting problems when you have some set of constraints or priors on your Fourier transform. And what we give is essentially a tight characterization. So an easy to compute function that matches up with what, you ex what we expect for classes we know. Like band limited takes about FT samples, sparse takes about K samples. And also we can prove that our characterization is tight. It's the minimum number of samples you need to recover continuous signals in all of these classes. The second part is the algorithmic part. How do you take these samples? And what we show is that there's actually a, uniform, a universal non-uniform sampling scheme that works for any prior on your uh, Fourier transform frequencies. So in particular, we saw a non-uniform sampling scheme for band-limited functions. You can use a very, very similar non-uniform sampling scheme, and it works for solving any of these uh, constrained Fourier fun function fitting problems. Um, so yeah, no matter, really no matter what your signal so looks like. So are you like. doing Bayesian inference then? Yeah, so today I'm going, OK. Today, I'm, I'm going to try not to talk too much about the Bayesian stuff because there's just a lot of notation. When I say solves it, for the smooth priors, we'll get like a uh, very tight approximation of the map, the map estimator in a Bayesian setting. For constraints, we'll get sort of a natural recovery guarantee, like what I said they get from those PSWFs. OK. And then finally, we have the samples. We give an efficient algorithm that can uh, compute this function y tilde of t for most, essentially any prior that comes up in practice. There's like one thing you need from that prior that I'll explain later. OK, so that's the results. 
And wh why I'm talking about it here is it really all uses tools from randomized numerical linear algebra um, applied in our setting to continuous operators. So I'm suggesting maybe we should call it randomized numerical functional analysis. But for you guys, I'm going to do everything in the picture of, lang in, of matrices and really all the tools we know for matrices carry over to these continuous function fitting problems. Okay, so this is work that will be on archive soon. Um, two of my co-authors, Haim and Cameron, are uh, around today, so uh, feel free to ask them about the results as well. Okay, so let's just formulate the problem formally for when we're looking at, looking at more general priors on our Fourier transform. We're going to do that, and this will get to your question about Bayesian inference, by defining a weighted Fourier transform, which I'm going to call F mu star. It's a weighted inverse Fourier transform. I'm calling it F mu star. Mu is, a, is what I'm going to call the distribution that constrains my Fourier transform. Okay, mu is that distribution. So for band limited functions, it's like a uniform distribution over an interval, but it can be any positive distribution. Okay, so the weighted Fourier transform is I look at my standard for inverse Fourier transform matrix, and I just add weights to different frequencies <coughs> corresponding to mu. And then I say, I want to solve that exact, I also have the notation messed up in this slide, but I want to solve that exact recovery problem that I said for band limited functions. I'm going to assume that, y, that I can observe f mu star of x for some function x plus noise. And I want to recover a signal y tilde that's close to my true signal. And close means that I have some epsilon dependence on the mu norm of x plus a constant times uh, the norm of my noise. So just so I have it done formally, when I say the two norm, that's like uh, the two norm over zero to t. And when I say the mu norm, that's also that's the two norm, but it's under the weighting uh, mu of the frequency. Okay. So in epsilon, the two normal parameter, because if I have more energy in my signal and I take more samples, I can get a better fit. But c is not because I can't hope to do better than a, than one times my noise. So I just care about getting like one or two, something like that. Okay. So. When you think about constrained Fourier transforms, sparse, band limited, multiband, this maps exactly onto the function recovery problem we were talking about. You're going to recover a signal close to your true signal with no error depending on the two norm of that signal over the lab frequencies. It gets a little bit more confusing to think about what this recovery guarantee looks like for smooth priors. But uh, one way to think about it is you, if a function uses is less likely, so it uses like frequencies that have a low weight. It's not hard to check that a solution of this has a higher weight x. So you'll get like more error if it's a rarer function. And you can make things formal through a Bayesian framework, which we do in the paper, but I'm not going to talk about today. OK, so how do we solve this function fitting problem? We reduce it to a regression problem. And this is a very, very popular idea. It's the idea behind Gaussian process regression. It's been used all over the place in the field. We're going to say that, and this takes like five minutes of working through on a piece of paper. If I find some function g that g tilde that approximately solves this regression problem, the Fourier transform of that function, the weighted Fourier transform, will be a, a will be close to y. So it will be a good y tilde. What's this regression problem? It's saying I want g to both. When I multiply it by its in the weighted inverse Fourier transform, it should be close to y, my true signal. And there's a penalty depending on the two, the two norm of g under my weight function. So where's the noise there? Do you treat the noise then as? So uh, yeah, I sort of I think of this as noiseless for now, is the easiest way to think about it. Yeah. I think I'm, y has noise. Yeah, but actually, let's, let's think of y as not having noise. So just because I, I slightly misdefined my y early on, Let's, we can think of the noiseless case. All these problems are still unknown in the noiseless case. So when you have noise, this would have noise. And what I would be claiming is that we get some y tilde that's close to the noiseless y. So I mean, this is not, this is of course not a problem I can solve because it's, this is a continuous operator. Like it's a regression problem defined from 0 to t. I would need all samples from 0 to t to solve a regression problem like this. But you can solve it by discretization, meaning that we just subsample some rows of that regression problem. This exactly corresponds to subsampling 
time domain points in my function. And I can at least discretize, yeah, so I, I basically discretize one dimension of the regression problem just by sampling time points. Okay, there's actually another infinite dimension in my regression problem, which is the frequency domain. We don't actually need to worry about that. So I claim that we can avoid discretizing the frequency domain completely as long as we have some closed form solution, some closed form formula for the Fourier transform of my weight matrix, my weight distribution mu. The reason is, is because you can reduce this problem where I've only subsampled time points basically to a kernel ridge regression problem where the kernel is the Fourier transform of mu. I'm not going to go through the details of this. This is what's done in Gaussian process regression. Really, anytime people solve these problems, all they care about is getting a time domain, the time domain samples. And then as long as you have an explicit formula for hat mu hat, you can solve this regression problem using uh, uh, kernel ridge regression techniques. Okay. So really, oh yeah, and I just wanted to mention that for most of the constraints we see, I mean, uh, they're very explicit functions, so we, we know closed form solutions for the um, for the transform. So really, our job reduces to this problem of figuring out how to sample time domain points. And the way we're going to do that is just use the exact same tools we've been using for sampling discrete regression problems, which you've heard about quite a bit this morning. We can solve this regression problem approximately if we sample rows, meaning time points, by their statistical leverage score. And in particular, their uh, ridge leverage score, which I've, I have defined here. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about the definition of this just yet, but we'll get to that. So you can sample by these probabilities, which are equal to statistical leverage score. The sum of those statistical leverage scores is equal to something called the statistical dimension of the regression problem, S mu of epsilon. And we need to take S mu of epsilon samples approximately to get a good approximate solution for the regression problem. So S mu of lambda, when you check it for functions we know about, like band-limited functions, sparse functions, it matches up with exactly the best known number of samples you need to solve the function fitting problem. So we sort of know it's a good, it's a good measure for sample complexity. And actually, you can prove it's an optimal measure for any of these constrained Fourier fitting problems. You can roughly think of S mu of epsilon as equaling the number of eigenvalues larger than epsilon in sort of like a natural symmetrization of our weighted Fourier transform. So those are eigen, the lambda I are eigenvalues of? It's of this matrix that's, this, this doesn't look like, uh, this is basically like a so positive semi-definite operator. Lambda, uh, on mu, the eigenvalues, right? Yes, exactly. It only depends on mu. So the number for a mu, you can define this operator. And this is not exactly the number of eigenvalues greater than epsilon. But you can think of it as roughly as that, because if lambda i is greater than epsilon, this is like one, between 1 half and 1. And then it has something that depends sort of on the tail of the eigenvalues. But for operators in this continuous setting, the tail falls off very fast. So it basically goes to 0. So think of it as the number of eigenvalues greater than epsilon. We'll revisit that in a bit. OK, so uh, the trouble is these leverage scores are hard to compute, even for discrete problems. And we actually have a more challenging problem here, because we can't just compute them for some discrete values of time. We need to compute them for like a continuum of time and then sample by the leverage scores over that continuum. It seems hard, but fortunately, we have a lot of structure on our side. So let's look at exactly what this leverage score equals. Let's ignore this regularization term for a second. What it is is I'm looking at a function, f mu star of g, and I'm saying, what's the maximum squared value of that function at time point t over the average squared value? And I'm doing this for a restricted class of functions. So I'm saying, take the maximum over functions g that don't have too high of norm under that weight mu. Because if g had really high norm, this bottom part of the fraction gets big, so the leverage really goes off to 0. So I'm saying, under sort of like low norm functions, what's the maximum value of the function at t over its average squared value? This is something that, for many types of functions, we know how to bound. And like in functional analysis approximation theory, we really care about obtaining bounds like this. So if you're familiar with like polynomials, bounds on the leverage score are given by the classic Bernstein inequality or Markov brothers inequality. So the Bernstein inequality set bounds 
exactly what I just said. You can use it to bound exactly the squared value of a polynomial at some point t over the average squared value of that polynomial by basically, if the polynomial is degree k, k divided by the distance of the time point from the edge of the interval. And Markov Brothers gives a similar bound, but it says at the edge of the interval, the polynomial can jump to at most k squared times its average squared value. Okay, so when we have a bound like that, that means we can just explicitly bound for polynomials, the leverage scores by a function like this. And if we integrate out this function, oh, I wanted to mention, this is exactly why like, you need to use some non-uniform distribution when you're trying to fit polynomials. So people often talk about Chebyshev nodes. If you instead did a randomized uh, scheme for interpolating polynomials, using a distribution like this, saying I need to sample more at the edge of the intervals, less as I fall off, would give something that looks very similar to the Chebyshev polynomials. It's exactly this type of distribution you need to avoid these like ringing effects that happen when you're trying to interpolate with uniform points. So we can look at this, this distribution and we can say, what's the total sum of our leverage scores? You integrate out these rectangles on the end and you get something that's like k. And you integrate under this curve and you get something that's like k log k. So using leverage score sampling, we can fit polynomials with k log k samples, which is a log factor off of like the best known methods, what you get from Chebyshev polynomials. What about Fourier fun constrained Fourier functions? You can show that you can do basically the exact same sorts of bounds for sparse Fourier functions. And that's sort of one of the key results in this recent line of work on fitting sparse Fourier functions. Essentially, you can get the same bounds on this leverage score function, explicit bounds, except you have a k to the fourth there instead of uh, k squared. Sort of the intuition for a result like this is that sparse Fourier functions, if you have uh, frequencies that are close together, they sort of behave like low degree polynomials modulated by some complex exponential. And the frequencies are far away from each other. They're sort of orthogonal to each other. So that's like the very rough idea why you can get bounds like this. You can get very similar bounds to the polynomial bounds for sparse Fourier functions. And what our key result is, how do you extend these bounds to all mu, all prior distributions? And we do that by using even more tools from randomized linear algebra. So one of the big lessons of randomized linear algebra, I guess, from the past decade or more, is that if I want an optimal Q rank approximation to a matrix, instead of just using, this is, this is from all uh, different lines of work that we'll hear about this week, instead of using Q singular vectors, I can get a pretty much optimal approximation that reconstructs my matrix using Q actual columns from the matrix. In our language, this means that if mu had statistical dimension S mu of epsilon, I can pretty much approximate that weighted inverse Fourier transform by a factorization of this form that looks like a sparse, it has only a small number of frequencies times some recombination matrix. This means that G, if it's small and norm under mu, looks like something that's the sum of a small number of complex exponentials, so it's sparse, plus noise. And what that allows you to do is translate these bounds for sparse Fourier functions exactly over to bounds for Fourier functions that are constrained under any distribution mu. So I'm not doing the, going, going to go into any of the details of that, but the takeaway is we can essentially sample time points by a distribution that looks very, very similar to what we did for polynomials or sparse Fourier functions. Um, and you get a really simple function out. You sample points by this fixed distribution, you use the, your form of the inverse, the Fourier transform of mu to construct a kernel matrix. And then you solve a kernel ridge regression problem on this discrete kernel matrix to get a, f a function fit to y over the interval. So that's, that's it. That's the uh, whole algorithm. So that's a linear system, right? Or right yeah, it's like a linear system using a kernel matrix is your final algorithm. And then there's like a simple sum reconstructs the value of y tilde t at any time point t. So that epsilon, is that the same epsilon that you have in your error bound? Uh, yes, that's the same epsilon we have in our error bound. So you for regularizing the curve. Yeah, so you might need to do like a binary search over epsilons or something, because you don't necessarily know that epsilon a priori. Yeah. So there's a bunch of open questions, but actually I think I'm tight on time, so I'll leave them up. And I suppose take questions, or maybe we're short, too short. Yeah. I think we have time for a few questions.
So there is also an uh, interpolating uh, polynomial function using leverage course. That's new, right? Uh, I suppose okay. it hasn't been written down, but it's it's really it's pretty easy to prove using okay. these bounds. And it may be, Eric, you, you guys even wrote this down at some point. Yeah, I think there was somebody else who did it before us. Yeah. So it's quite direct. The one nice thing about that is you can use that result for polynomials to re-derive fitting for band-limited functions. So you can match like all that but stuff. Let, from, let me yeah. understand something else, actually. So it's off by a factor or a logarithmic factor compared to Chebyshev polynomials, right? Yeah. Um, is that which, because of the randomization? Is that the usual reason? That because no, I, no, it's not actually. I suspect yeah. that maybe because my analysis is not tight. It's basically coupon collector. Yeah. A sort of D region the yeah. But is that, is that the reason? Yeah. That's the classical reason for leverage course being off. Yeah, exactly. I thought you said yeah. no. So. Oh, no, wait. It's not, sorry, I meant like it's not off because the point, it's not because like some, it's not that I got a bound of K and then could have gotten it by only gotten that log k from random sampling. At least for us, we only bounded the sum of leverage scores by k log k. So really, if we did random sampling, we would lose two log factors. But maybe there's a way of making that tighter that I don't so know. For polynomials, I think we have the sum to be k. So is yeah. there a form of a deterministic variant? I mean, going Yes, down. yes. So that, yeah, there is. And I have this as an open question. Uh, there should be a hope of a deterministic variant also for like any of these function classes I talk about. Yeah. But we don't have anything like that. It would be a different way of uh, doing what Yeah, you getting a deterministic interpol like, uh, interpolation schemes, basically. But that's not known. That's, that's right. not known, yeah. And you can avoid the Homer phenomenon. You avoid that using our method, but it's a random sampling scheme. So maybe you could avoid it. Maybe you could use these ideas from leverage scores to spit out like some fixed number of samples, yeah. like the Chebyshev nodes, yeah. that I just know ahead of time and can use. Yeah. Do you need a nature of the solver for the? Previous slide. You can use an iterative solver. And there's actually a bunch, I forget the names, there's a bunch of solvers that people already use for band limited functions that don't have that you can view as iterative solvers of this problem. Uh, but yeah. K is a matrix, so you can use any iterative solver. So, it's it's symmetric. Oh, symmetric. Yeah, symmetric and positive definite. Uh, it's a kernel matrix, yeah. so it's uh, CG. Okay. Yeah, or maybe it's height, yeah. So I think we need to move to the next one. Let's thank uh, Chris again.